Let us begin our worship service tonight with these words of God in Psalm 84. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Let's unite our hearts together this evening in silent prayer. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help stands in the name of Jehovah, who has made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God our Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and by the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That sounds a lot better than it does when the church is empty on Sunday night. It's so very good to see each one of you. Very good to be with you by God's grace in his house. And that we can experience God confirming in our hearts what he has done. That we truly do love the house of God and his church. Let us now come before him in singing. We're going to start with number 375. The words will be up here on the wall. Number 375 is taken from Psalm 135, Invitations to Praise. And tonight we're going to sing the stanzas one through three, one, two, and three, and then stanza five, Singing from the heart, 375.
Let's make confession of our faith together this evening in the familiar words of the Apostles' Creed, with each one of us saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue in our worship tonight, and we sing from Psalter 11. Psalter number 11. An arrangement of Psalm 5, prayer and protection. O Jehovah, Hear my words, to my thoughts attentive be, hear my cry, my King, my God, I will make my prayer to thee. We sing prayerfully from the heart together, the four stanzas, number 11. Let us now come together in the worship of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven with special thanksgiving in our hearts, we assemble in this place tonight. For we know that it is in the assembly of the saints especially where thy spirit, O Lord, works powerfully in our hearts. We have thanked thee over the last 10 weeks when we have had many services in our own homes. And thou hast been with us as a single member, as a couple, as an aged, 
as a family. And we are thankful, Lord, that now we might again enter into thy house, not because of an outward faith, but because of a true heart, sincere, believing that in this way, in the communion of saints, our hearts are especially fed and nourished, and we need that. And so we are thankful that we have this privilege again given to us. We have learned, for everything is a lesson to us. Thou art our Father, the perfect teacher. We have learned through COVID-19 to esteem highly and to see the preciousness of the Church of Jesus Christ, that we are members of one body and that our spiritual lives are woven together. And so, Heavenly Father, may we with heart sincere and with true humility and with joy, with gladness and with thanksgiving and in peace, may we say to each other tonight, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father, that in this place, this holy place, this sacred place, thou would perform thy work for heaven, molding, preparing, teaching, correcting, and opening our hearts to see, parting the heavens in this place for us, that we might peer into the mysteries, the eternal mysteries of thy love and grace, and that we may lay hold of the promises that are set before us in Jesus Christ, that they may live, beat, and vibrate in our hearts, in order that we may live that Christian life, that life in Christ in the midst of this world. We thank thee for keeping us from this virus or giving us healing from the virus. And bless, O oh Lord, the efforts then tonight that we seek to be wise, that we seek to extend due caution against this disease which is in thy hand. But Lord, remind us that there are more deadly diseases than COVID-19. That there are viruses that to our folly we spread. We spread willfully with our mouth, with our thoughts. And the virus, O oh Lord, so often of gossip, the virus so often of slander and cutting each other down, the temptations that we can give to each other, the ill will that we can express to one another, viruses that infect, that hurt, that seize upon the breathing, that seize upon the heart of a child of God, make us clean from the virus of sin. It infects us. We are defenseless. Lord, give us that we might have the healing mercies of Christ in our hearts and that we may not be one who spreads, but that we might walk in the light even as he is in the light. We pray, O oh Lord, for the assurance of forgiveness of our sins. We pray for strength, always that strength to do not our own will, not to follow our own desires, not to plot our own way, but to give our lives entirely into thy will and walk in a way of obedience to Jesus Christ, following after him, trusting in him to care for us. We pray that thou wilt grant that to us, each one. Remember, O Lord, the flock, comfort the springs of a family and the death of a dear grandmother and great-grandmother. We thank thee, O Lord, for the memory of parents who, and grandparents who have walked in the ways of the Lord. We remember Amy Undersma and Dave and their family 
tonight as Amy's mother is very near to death. We pray, Lord Jesus, wilt thou come and deliver her from the sufferings of this present time that she may sit before thee in the realm of glory through Jesus Christ. We ask for thy blessing upon Julie Tinklenberg and the recovery, O Lord, of the surgery that she had this past Friday. We remember the aged, in particular tonight, we think of John and Joanne Huskin, that thou be near to them in their afflictions and trials, and many, many other of the aged couples in our congregation and of our widows and widowers, that thou would draw near, that thou would comfort them, that thou would give them this good, perfect hope, building up their hope and making them productive and serving thee, even unto their end. Bless the married state among us. Keep us, Lord, in that married state in humility. Keep us in forgiveness one of another. Work in us as husbands that we may cherish our wife, even as our own body. That we may bring her up spiritually and nurture and love and care for her and see to the spiritual growth of her heart and soul. Bless us as wives that we may respect honor, build up, encourage, walk by the side of, be the dear companion, the counselor, and the trust, the one in whom our husband trusts, and forgive us of all the weaknesses and all the sins that attend us. Wash them away. Bless, O oh Lord, our children. We thank thee again for our schools and for the graduates that we have. Remember, O oh Lord, our churches, our synod that will meet in a week, the installation of Pastor Matani and Hope next Sunday morning, and the call that thy servant has to the church at Kalamazoo. Bless, O oh Lord, our churches, anointing them with wisdom, humility, keeping out all schism, all needless division from us. Bless our children, our little children, children in the womb. Bless the special needs children. Bless brothers and sisters that we know who are going through a very, very difficult time. And strengthen them. And now may the meditation of our hearts and may the thoughts of our minds be acceptable to thee. And may the Holy Spirit breathe upon us that we may say not only I was glad to go up to the house of God, but that we may exit saying it was good. It was good for me to have been in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name do we pray these things. Amen. We may all worship the Lord in our offering tonight by placing our offering on the table, the collection baskets and the table in the narthex. The offerings for today were for the general fund and benevolence and then also for the beacon lights and for First Edmonton Church Building Fund. And I'd like to read these verses of Holy Scripture which speak to us concerning the heart of giving. We read in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, But this I say, He who sows sparingly shall weep also sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. We open our Psalters again, and we turn now to number 192. Psalter 192. 
a prayer of faith, and this is from Psalm 71. We, if you recall, a year ago, this was the psalm that we memorized for the uh, summer Bible memory. And this is the psalm of an aged saint of God uh, asking for God's presence as an aged saint. We're thinking of Jacob, our series on Jacob tonight, and also his desire to instill into the family, the children coming after him, the fear of God. We're going to sing the first five stanzas, one through five of number 192. We open the scriptures together tonight in God's word in Genesis chapter 47. We will begin reading at verse 27. We will read through chapter 48. In chapter 48, we're going to have Jacob's prophetic blessing upon Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Because it's such an important passage, we're going to, next Sunday as well, look at verses 15 and 16 of chapter 48 in more detail. Tonight we'll go over the history that we have in Genesis 47, beginning at 27 through chapter 48. Now reading God's word, Genesis 47, 27, and Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen. And they had possessions therein, and grew, and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt seventeen years. So the whole age of Jacob was an hundred forty and seven years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. 
And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, Swear unto me. And he swore unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan, that's Bethel, and blessed me, and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make thee a multitude of people and will give that, this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. And thy issue, which thou begettest after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. And as for me, when I came from Paddan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way when yet there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same as Bethlehem. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons, whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he, that is Joseph, brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face. And lo, God has showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, so they were standing in front of him. And he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand. And Manasseh in his left hand, toward Israel's right hand. And brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, did walk, the God which fed me all, the, all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, 
saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. May God sanctify these scriptures tonight to our hearts. The time had drawn nigh for Jacob to die, that Jacob, verse 29, must die. Not only does that mean that his body, 147 years old, was now worn, but it means that the time that God had appointed for each one of our death and for his death had now come. The time in which God had worked upon him to prepare him for his eternal reward. Two things come to the mind of Jacob when he thinks about death. The first is his burial. Where will he be buried? The second is his family. He must complete his work for his family. In both of these tonight, we see that he is called Israel for he will act like Israel. Israel means prince with God. And he will not act as the Jacob of old with manipulation, with trying to connive and arrange things, but he will act in trust. He will be submissive. He will do the will of God as God works it through him, for Jacob is even a prophet that he must prophesy concerning these two sons of Joseph, he will die in true faith. He will die by God's grace as prince with God, as Israel. The chapter this evening opens with God's rich blessing upon Jacob in verse 27 of chapter 47. And this should not surprise us. We read, And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, and he multiplied exceedingly, abundantly. It does not surprise us because we have seen that throughout his life, even when Jacob was not walking in the way of God's will, that nevertheless God caused him to multiply. When he was in the land of Haran, his uncle tried to cheat him out of all of his efforts and failed. When he was in the land of Canaan, his sons murdered a whole community, and yet Jacob still prospered in his farming. And now in Egypt, after 17 years, in a strange land, they again have multiplied exceedingly. And the conclusion that we bring is not this, that, well, okay, I may say to you that if you come to church and if you serve God a little bit and give him a thousand, well, he will multiply you exceedingly. And you follow God and you're going to just go through the roof in earthly blessings. No. No. But the application is that God is a gracious God and Father to us that even though we so often don't deserve it, yet his promise abides sure and faithful. He has loved us eternally in Christ. And therefore the application is Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This massive multiplication was in fulfillment of God's promise because you remember, already to Abraham, Genesis 14, he had foretold that his descendants would go down to Egypt for 400 years where God's purpose would be to make them into a great nation. And Jacob now understands this. He understands why Joseph was sold as a slave. His generations 
might now multiply in the land of Egypt, that God would use the world for the church. He understands that his multiplication, the blessings that he is being bestowed, is not due to the expertise that he had gained as a shepherd. It was not due to his DNA that he was particularly a fertile DNA with many sons, but it was God's promise. But now he must prepare for death. Seventeen years have quickly slipped away. When he came at the age of 130, you will recall, when he stood before Pharaoh, he did not expect to live much longer. Before Pharaoh, we get the impression that he thought he was very close, but God gave him 17 more years. We don't know when we are going to die. We get near the age of retirement and we say another 15 or 20 years. And sometimes that doesn't happen. At the age of 60, 50, dementia may come. At other times we may go through medical problems at the age in our 50s, early 60s. We don't expect that we're going to live much longer and God gives us another 20, 25 years. We do not know. But the key to it is here again, living by faith in Jesus Christ. Each day, old or young, each day and each time in Jesus Christ is significant, is important that we be productive. No matter our age, that we be productive in the service of of our God. Jacob will be productive in the service of his God. May you and I be productive. May we face death, face life as Israel in faith, trust in God. I call your attention then to Israel faces death his burial request, and then his deliberate blessing. As is often the case with an old person, there was something on Jacob's mind. And he wanted to talk to his son that he trusted about it. What was on his mind was the place of his burial. He calls Joseph to him, to have Joseph promise to him that when he dies, his body will be carried out of the land of Egypt back to the land of Canaan. I would have you note with me, this is edifying for all of us, but it's edifying especially for parents, that his request to his son came in the form of an entreaty, that it was not simply a command that he issued to his son, but that is an entreaty unto his son's heart and soul. This is something that he realizes after he dies, he has no power to see that it will ever happen. He must trust in his son, Joseph. And so he appeals not to the command, but he appeals to the entreaty, to the heart of his son. He will address his son in his heart. That's very important for us as parents, especially when we get older and our children are adults. Jacob said unto him, If now I have found grace, if I have favor in your sight, Joseph, put, I pray thee, thy right hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. He is entreating. He wants Joseph to know how absolutely important this is to him. He knows that this is going to be difficult. This is going to be time consuming. There's not modern transportation that he can send this body off on the rails or some other way. This will be much work. He's the prime minister of Egypt. He will have to set aside his work. And so he says, if I have favor in your eyes, 
If it's more than just father and son, it is that. But if it's grace, same faith, then do this for me. And then he uses covenant language. Deal kindly and truly with me. That word kindly is loving kindness or mercy. Truly is truth. And you remember that when I say covenantal language, you'll remember that repeatedly in the scriptures, God speaks this way, that he deals with us. How does he deal with us? In mercy and in truth, O Lord. Have mercy and truth. Kindness, Lord. Kindness to me and truth. Remembering all of thy promises, Lord. Lord, we say to him in the covenant, not as I deserve, but deal with me in mercy and in truth. We're speaking to the heart of God. Jacob speaks to the heart of his son. The place where his body will rest is important. Not in Egypt, he says, but I will lie with my fathers and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. That burying place, you flip over just one page to chapter 49, verses 29 and 30, you'll see that that burying place was a distinct place. It was called Machpelah. Verse 29 of Genesis 49, And he charged them and said unto them, now he's speaking to all of his sons, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham brought from the field of Ephron, the Hittite, for a possession in a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, There I buried Leah. Leah died sometime before their journey to Egypt. He had buried her in Machpelah. Machpelah was the place that Abraham had purchased for Sarah. And Jacob says, that's where I will be buried, in that same place cave next to my grandfather and grandmother, next to my father and my mother, with Leah. Not Rachel, with Leah, the covenant mother of Judah. I must be buried there. Now why was that so important? We say to Jacob, Jacob, surely the way to heaven is no longer from Egypt than from Canaan. Why does it matter? And we know the answer. We know the first answer. The answer would be that Canaan is that picture of the new heavens and the new earth that are promised in Jesus Christ. That Canaan, the land of Canaan itself, was a picture of that eternal fellowship that is ours in Jesus Christ with God. We know that, remember, children? We know that from Hebrews chapter 11. Because it tells us that they did not seek, they were not just interested in the real estate of Canaan. They weren't interested in that physical land, but they were interested in what that land represented to them. A heavenly, a better city that God had made for those who belonged to him. That's what Jacob wants. He wants that. He wanted that eternal inheritance with God in the promised Christ. He wanted that from the time he was a little boy. When he was a little boy in his father's tent. Yes, it got all messed up with his own foolish self-will and conniving and failure to trust in God. But that's what he wanted. Still more, he then wanted to be identified with his fathers, Abraham and Isaac and his grandmothers. Not just that the burial plots were all with the family name, but because with his fathers he was more than just father and son. 
and grandson. He was heir in Jesus Christ. They were bound in life. And they were bound in death. They lived in life out of the same faith. And after death, they went to the same inheritance. They would be together in death. Their bodies would be raised together. The same is true of us. We bury. We bury our bodies of our loved ones in the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not because God needs a buried body or he can't rise it, raise it. No. We do that in our confession. We were one in life. We shall be one in Christ. And on that day, we shall be raised together. And therefore, it was important that it be a witness to his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, to the whole nation of Israel. Jacob knows that his sons grandsons and future generations will be living in Egypt and he wants his burying place to be a message to them a testimony that they don't belong in Egypt that God is going to come take them out that this prosperity that they were enjoying in Egypt that they must not get lost in prosperity that his sons must not now think or his grandsons must not now think we're doing good in Egypt. This world is a pretty good place. But he wanted them to know that this world, no matter its prosperity that we might enjoy for a season, is not our home. This is not where we belong. We are pressing on to another place, that sure place, that heavenly abode. He wanted to speak to his sons and family to come. He wanted to witness we witness to our children, our grandchildren, in how we are buried, in how we are buried and how we make those arrangements, we are witnessing to them, not only of where we belong with God, but of where they must press and where they must go. This was very important to Joseph, so he made his son swear an oath. And he said to Joseph, swear to me, make an oath. And he swore to him. Now, why would Jacob do that? Why would he go to the extremes that he does for this oath? Because after all, this is Joseph. This is his, I'm going to say, very trustworthy. The other sons are repentant, but this is Joseph, kindred heart with this son. Loyal, loving. And yet, Jacob is insistent on the point. There must be an oath. He begins by having Joseph place his hand under his thigh, under a person's thigh, back of his leg. Place your hand under my thigh. And if you remember in your Bible, this was exactly what Abraham, Genesis 24, verse 2, when he sends his trusted servant Eliezer, to the land of Haran to get a wife for Isaac and he says to them you have to bring back a God-fearing wife and if you cannot find a God-fearing wife bring back no wife and you have to swear that that is what you're going to do put your hand under my thigh it was a way of expressing a solemn oath of submission it was a way of submission to the one who is speaking to you, I will do 
what you are asking me to do. So he did that. He put his hand under his thigh and he said, I will do that. But more, even after Joseph says that, I will do that, Father. Dad, I'm going to do that. Jacob goes on and says, but now I need a verbal. I need a verbal oath from you. Verbally, swear to me. And Joseph is not offended. He's not put off by his dad, saying, Dad, I said I would. He's not offended. And he swears in the name of God. Why? I think there are two reasons here. The first is that Jacob is thinking well into the future in these verses we read. He's thinking well also into the future of the fact that Joseph is prime minister in Egypt. And I'll just, I think you'll get the point if I just say it. If Joseph comes to Pharaoh when Jacob dies and said, says to him, I'd like to bury my father in Egypt. I'll be gone for a few months. Or if he says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, my father made me swear. He put me in, under an oath. My father made me swear that I would bury his body in Canaan. So certainly that would give more le leverage that Joseph would have with Pharaoh. But there's a spiritual reason here. And that spiritual reason is that oaths in the name of God bind us. Bind us to each other. Bind us not simply in I must and have to, but bind us together in one commitment to God and to Christ. The oath that we swear to each other in marriage, the oath that we take in the baptism of a child, that we will, to the utmost of our ability, bring them up in the fear of God, the oath that we take when we enter into an office as pastor, elders, and deacons. They bind us. Not force us. But they are the expression in our marriage, in our family. They are the expression of the binding of one faith and one hope in Christ. And after Joseph swears... We read, Israel bowed himself on the bed's head. That does not mean that he fell backwards, exhausted, on the backboard against his pillow. It was over. But it means that he worshipped. When he bowed himself, it probably means that he got on his hands and knees at the head of his bed and put his hands on his bed and prayed. He bowed in prayer that God had given him strength to do this. We say to tie up this loose end, to do this thing. And he's ready. To meet his Lord. He didn't have strength to get up and go with Joseph to what we would say church. The best he can do with his old body is kneel. Maybe he can't even do that, but he worships at the head of his bed. Sometimes we get old if we go down on our knees. We might not get up without help. Sometimes the only thing we can do is lay on our bed. 
That's all we can do. We're alone in a bed. Maybe tonight, right now, alone in a bed listening to this sermon. That's all we can do. All we can do? No. We can worship our faithful God. We can thank him. We can put things in order in our hearts. In chapter 48, Jacob will perform the deed. And that's why we want to spend another sermon on it. He will perform the deed, do you know, that is mentioned in Hebrews 11 concerning him. In all of his life, what is mentioned about Jacob in Hebrews 11? By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph. So this incident that we read, especially in the last part of chapter 48, is what is mentioned of Jacob as a hero of faith. Bless both the sons of Joseph and worship leaning upon the top of his staff. And the point is that he deliberately blessed them the way he did. Blessing the younger, switching his hand upon the younger Ephraim over the older in acquiescence to the will of God. That God had revealed to him that Ephraim would be a more dominant tribe than would be Manasseh. And so the chapter began, so, so the important thing here is that his faith is seen in his submission, which was the whole issue in Joseph's life and in ours. Joseph, Jacob believed, but he believed he knew better. And in his death, he doesn't know better. He trusts to do the will of God. That's all. So the chapter begins with Joseph taking care of his dying father. When he heard that his father was sick, he came to visit him in obedience to the fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. And visit them especially when they are sick, as we have done, by God's grace, visiting our loved ones through a window in a nursing home, but we have visited them. And he brings his two sons, his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, in Egypt. He has married a Seneth, a Seneth, who was the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. And with her has two sons, Manasseh. These men are in their early 20s. Manasseh, which means God hath made me to forget my afflictions. And Ephraim, which means fruitful. And it could well be speculation perhaps on my part. But it could be that his wife, Asenath, is with him in this chapter. If you look at verse 6 the eyesight of uh, Israel is very dim, but Jacob, Jacob says in verse six, and thy issue, which thou shalt beget after them, that is, if you have more children after these two, those additional children will not be reckoned as their own tribes, but will be reckoned, he says, under Manasseh and Ephraim. So you get the idea you might have more children. It could well be that his daughter-in-law, Joseph's wife, was there with them. But they have come then to visit their father. And then the whole scene, as it develops, is intended by the Holy Spirit to remind us of something. The Holy Spirit wants us to be thinking about something now as Manasseh and Ephraim have come before Jacob and he must bless them. And I'll give you more hints. And he is 
dim, eyesighted, and the blessing is going to be contrary to what you would expect. He's going to cross his hands because the whole passage is here intending to remind us of when Jacob and Esau appeared before their father Isaac to be blessed. The similarities were Isaac and now Jacob were almost blind. The similarities were that these blessings would be prophetic. In the case of Jacob and Esau, prophetic of God's eternal election and reprobation, not in the blessing of Manasseh and Ephraim. means one tribe will be greater than the other. It's not referring here to election and reprobation, but they will be prophetic. And in both, the younger is favored. The difference between the two is that Isaac unwittingly blessed the right one, Jacob, because Jacob was deceiving him into thinking that he was Esau. But again, the point of the Holy Spirit here is that Jacob, when it comes to blessing and obtaining blessing, is no longer trying to manipulate. He's no longer saying to God, this is the way blessing will come into my life. In this manner, I can connive my way. If I connive good enough, I will be blessed. He's not thinking that way anymore. He simply submits to God's will in the matter of blessing. And so as he's going to bless these two sons, his mind has to go back. His mind has to go back to that day when with the help of his mother, he deceived his father into giving him the birthright blessing. And he must be thinking, God is sovereign in blessing. God is sovereign. He is supreme. He is not only sovereign in election and reprobation of who will be saved, but he is also sovereign in here, Manasseh and Ephraim, in bestowing gifts and abilities and place. For the younger will be more gifted than the older and have a larger place in the service of God than the older. He must be thinking when it comes to blessing of children. God is sovereign. When it comes to blessing in our life, God is sovereign. And he must be thinking, I'm just, as I've been saying, he's going to trust God to bestow this blessing. He must be thinking, this is the way it should have been in my life. It should have been with me and my mother that day when we heard that he was going to bless Esau It should have been this way. No deceit. No tricks. No lies. No costume disguise. None of that. Trust. God. Don't try to edge in. Don't try to beat somebody out. Trust God to do the good. He must have been thinking, it's simpler. It's far simpler to put my life right into God's hand and let him do what is good to me, asking only one thing, just one thing. Give me to do thy will. 
we note here that as Jacob appears before him with his son, that Israel does some reminiscing, some remembrances. And we might think that when he begins to remembrance and then he finally gets around to the blessings at the end of the chapter, we might think that we're dealing simply with an old man who loses train of his thought and begins to ramble a bit and needs a few pointers to get back to the point. But then our thinking would be wrong. He is not rambling. He does bring up a number of things that are very important. There are a lot of things on his heart. He's lived a very full life. He has experienced God's forgiving grace time after time. And so he brings up in verse 16 the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, who watched over his life every step of his way. In his thinking, he goes back to Bethel with the ladder of promise. Verses 3 and 4, when God appeared to him at the top of the ladder, assuring him that he would give him the promise of the land of Egypt and the promise, uh, not of the land of Egypt, of Canaan, and the promise of the seed, Jesus Christ. He thinks about Rachel at this moment, who died shortly after he had returned to the land of Canaan when she gave birth to Benjamin and of how she had wanted to have more children. He thinks of different incidents in his life that the scripture don't mention to us at all. The last verse, verse 22, he thinks of the time that he fought with his sword and with his bow to take back property that he had paid for that the Amorites had taken away from him and that he wants Joseph to have. He thinks of Joseph. When Joseph draws near, he says to him, I had never thought I would see you alive again. But this is not rambling. This is not loose thoughts. This is not dementia. This is not Parkinson's. This is not a man who can't get to the point. This is one speech. It's the speech that we want to give when we come to die. It's the speech of God's grace over all of my life. And now I see it. Now I see it in every detail. It was God's faithful grace Do you see that? It's no rambling account. But it's God's grace running through anguish, running through fear, running through frustration, running through death and sorrow. It was always all about God's grace to him that never left him. And so that leads him to the final act in the plan of God. He must bless these two sons of Joseph. And the final act or deed in the will of God has to do with the constitution of the Old Testament church into the twelve tribes of Israel. And he will see to that now as a prophet Because at this meeting, when his sons, Joseph's sons, come to him, he says to Joseph at the get-go, when they come, those two boys of yours, your two sons, will be as my own. They will be like Reuben, my firstborn, and Simeon, my secondborn, Manasseh and Ephraim. He says, already then, he says, Ephraim and Manasseh. He puts them in that order. They shall be their own tribe. As I said, he says to them, if you have more issue, if you have more children with your wife, they will not receive their own tribes. They will be assumed under Manasseh and Ephraim. But there shall be these two tribes from you, Joseph, in Israel. So you say, but then, Reverend, that's not 12 tribes. That's 13 tribes. And that's correct because it's going to be the will of God through Moses that the tribe of Levi 
will not be a tribe that receives a physical inheritance in Canaan, but will become the tribe of the priests. So that the will of God for the constitution of his people on earth must be fulfilled. And not only that, he's not rambling. Because after he speaks of the fact that these two boys shall be mine, they shall be reckoned as one of my sons, with full inheritance of my sons. After he's done talking, he says that, he talks about Rachel, who died, and who wanted more sons. And she shall have another. There shall be three of my sons. There shall be Benjamin, and Joseph will now count for two. And God's eyes are watching over it. And he not only claims them, but he blesses them. Joseph, as we read, brings them forward. And he lines them up intentionally for his aged father who is near blind and very frail. He lines them up intentionally by putting Joseph, putting Manasseh on his left and Ephraim on his right so that when they appear to Jacob, Manasseh will come to Jacob's right and Ephraim, the younger, will come to Jacob's left. So if Jacob just puts out his hands, his right hand will fall upon Manasseh, and his left hand upon Ephraim. And he brings the boys forward, and he bows his head. He bows his head not to see that Jacob wittingly, though he is dim, let of God crosses his hands and puts his right hand on the younger Ephraim and his left hand on the older Manasseh. And under that posture speaks the blessing that we'll look at next time of verses 15 and 16. He speaks the blessing. And near the end of this, Joseph looks up and he sees what his father has done. And we have a very strange thing here that now J Joseph reacts instantly and Joseph is not ready to acquiesce to this. No, no, now Joseph thinks this is wrong. He believes that his father somehow is confused. He's a confused old man. He needs help. And he's, he reaches forth and he says, not so, my father, not so. It's as if he puts his hand on his wrist and he wants to put the hands back to where he believes, where he believes the blessing ought to be. And Jacob says to him, I know it, my son, I know it. I know what I'm doing. You want me to bless Manasseh first. He shall become a, a tribe. But my right hand must go upon Ephraim, for he shall become a great tribe, a multitude of people, which is true. The tribe of Ephraim next to Judah becomes the most dominant tribe among the 12 tribes, Ephraim. Joshua will come from Ephraim. I know it, my son. I know it. This is God's will. He acts like Israel, prince with God. You see him? 147 years learning one lesson. 
But the lesson is in his heart. Submit to God and trust and faith. Submit to him in death that he will take care of you. That the hope that you have in him will not be lost. Submit to him and the blessings that he shows upon you and your family. Submit to his will. Do only that which is good to him and he will take care of you. 147 years. But he learned it by God's grace. He always knew it. He submits to it as an old man. And yet, he's alive in faith, in hope, and in love. May our last days be like Father Jacob. Amen. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for thy word. We pray that the Holy Spirit may bind that word to our hearts and teach us out of the Holy Scriptures tonight. Receive again our praise that we could be here in such good number and continue to guide and keep us as a congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 204 in our Psalter. Number 204, God our only good. We're going to sing the stanzas two, three, and four. We begin with stanza two. Ever, O Lord, with thee, all shall be well with me, held by thy hand, and thou wilt guide my feet by thy own counsel sweet, till I for glory meet and glory stand. We sing from the heart the stanzas two, three, and four, number 204.
After the closing blessing, the congregation is asked, please, to be seated, and the elders will help us in dismissing. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious to thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.